you know, we have been doing better at mitigating the loss of bone. Um, and astronauts, it used to be one to 2% per month of loss, where aging females would lose 1% per year. So we've been able to mitigate that some with exercise, with vitamin D, with, with the diet, with in, in, even in some cases tested um, bisphosphonates to try to mitigate that. So we know that we can slow it down. We cannot necessarily eliminate it. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to another week with Drew and Alex here at Mops and Moe's. Uh, closing out our four-part NASA series, Alex, this week we have? We have Judy Hayes. And as you might expect from somebody with the job title of Chief Science Officer of the Human Health and Performance Directorate at NASA's Johnson Space Center, she has a pretty impressive resume. So strap in. There's going to be a little bit here. It's all great stuff. Uh, she came to Johnson Space Center in 1984 as a research scientist in the Neurosciences Laboratory. She established the Exercise Physiology Laboratory in 1987. She was principal investigator on two space shuttle experiments studying the effects of microgravity on skeletal muscle performance in astronauts. We hear a little bit about that in this episode. Uh, during her career, she managed the physiology laboratories, reduced gravity programs, space medicine project, and integration of biomedical research for the space shuttle, Russian Mir shuttle, and international space station programs. In addition to Johnson Space Center, she managed NASA laboratories at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia, as well. Her scope involves extensive collaboration with the Japanese, European, and Canadian space agencies, including membership in the International Countermeasures Working Group for Developing Global Standards for Spaceflight Exercise and Research. She also publishes papers and book chapters on spaceflight exercise physiology and lectures for various undergraduate programs at the University of Texas and various training programs for flight surgeons and astronaut candidates. Judy earned her Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Exercise Physiology from West Virginia University, followed by a Master of Public Health degree in Occupational Health slash Aerospace Medicine from University of Texas Health Sciences Center. She completed a joint fellowship at the Royal College of Surgeons in England and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, supporting epidemiologic research in the development of clinical practice guidelines for the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. Um, she's won a bunch of awards, distinguished graduate kind of stuff, as well as the NASA Silver Snoopy Award. Sorry, what is a Silver Snoopy? It's the Astronauts' Own Award for Outstanding Performance. So that's an award the astronauts give to people who support them in exceptional ways. The silver Snoopy. So, yeah, I mean, it goes without saying here that Judy is uh, very accomplished, very intelligent. And I, I couldn't think of a better way to capstone this four part series. We've we've kind of gone from the uh, the boots on the ground perspective, so to speak, uh, with the astronaut. Uh, then we've gone through the human performance element of of NASA with the staff, the ACER staff. And then now to get sort of the. Uh, I guess the bird's eye umbrella view of where this entire program is going and some of the things that they are interested in from a scientific perspective. Truly fascinating. You know, this is one of those episodes that you you, you could listen to on its own, and it, it definitely stands on its own. But as with the other three, we would encourage folks to sort of go through the whole series to get, to gain the ideal perspective of what human performance at NASA truly looks like. Especially now, I don't know how many people are paying really close attention to spaceflight stuff. There's been some cool developments. The Artemis mission is progressing. We're hopefully going to have astronauts back on the moon real soon. Whee! And if you've been following along with our episodes, and I, I think it gets discussed in this one a little bit, but the the International Space Station has been the entire focus of a lot of NASA stuff for a while, or at least the manned NASA activities. We've certainly sent probes farther out. But that mission is coming to a close in just a few years, and they plan to hand over low earth orbit to commercial interests, meaning more quote unquote civilians go into space, right? It means Elon Musk, right? It means, it means a lot of things. Um, it means that there's going to be a lot of talk about like, how do we keep humans safe and healthy in space when they're not military or government kind of professional astronauts. And it means that NASA is going to be shifting their focus to longer duration, farther, more extreme type of missions, things that might include like possible permanent settlements on the moon and things like that. Some really, really crazy stuff is on the horizon or probably above the horizon, depending on what time of day it is, if you're looking at the moon. 
but we nice. got some uh some really neat things that they're going to have to grapple with in terms of the microgravity of being in space, the fractional gravity of being on the moon and Mars, all sorts of crazy stuff that figuring out how humans handle that stuff is is a really neat problem set to be working on. Yeah, so uh, come with us today as we go uh, to infinity and beyond. Enjoy. Okay, well, I wanted to ask you because I have no real clue. I know Alex knows a little bit more than I do about the human performance research space over at NASA. But if I if I have this correct, your official job title is Chief Science Officer for NASA's Human Health and Performance Directorate. Would you agree that that is the coolest job title in all of physiology? <laughs> I, I don't know if it's the coolest job title. It's a new title for me. Um, because um, in the past I was a division chief over all the all the research labs, and um, so this is a new a new uh, journey for me um, as being chief science officer. So I'm excited to be here. Is there? I know you can't answer this question, but is there a chief science officer for NASA's non-human health and performance director? <laughs> There are other chief. Well, there's a NASA <laughs> headquarters chief scientist for everything. So I'm just a small part of that. What is your purview, I suppose, as as that kind of lead from the physiology standpoint. Well, it, yeah, it's 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 physiology, environmental sciences, uh, medicine. You know, whatever we're doing um, as far as 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 science and research, and a big part of my job is is policy and research integrity, which is great. Uh, you know, we have lots of scientists that know how to do science, but then we have others like engineers and clinicians that may not be, you know, that are engaging in, in research, which I think is great. Um, so part of this is to develop our scientists and others in how to do science, but also um, engage in partnerships. So we have partnerships with industry and academia and also with the military, with the DOD. So it's, it's setting up some of those partnerships and encouraging collaborations. We sort of asked this question in a couple of different ways, I think, to the human performance team and then sort of actually, you know, Shane as an actual astronaut, mm -hmm. but mentioning partnerships, and this might go into a little bit of a tangent, but one of the things I'm curious about is this kind of commercialization of, of space and what that means for sending human beings into outer space who may obviously not have the same amount of training or prep or quite frankly, research behind them that you guys do. What are some of the physiological consequences that we could anticipate from that kind of thing? Or will it be as easy as hopping on a Delta flight and going to Los Angeles? Well, maybe someday. Um, <laughs> it, it is, a, first of all, commercial commercialization of space is really a game changer. It's very exciting for all of us. And NASA is excited about it. And we're here to try to enable that. Um, and we want people to leverage the 60 years of NASA space flight knowledge and experience so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So we are here to share what we know. The evidence that we know to date is published and on, you know, it's published in the literature, but it's also published in these ev evidence books on, on a website, on one of the human research programs websites. So we've done the homework for people. Um, please use it. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it, and we try to update those every year or two to make sure that it's it's pretty um, it's pretty updated. So again, you know, we're here to help. And you know, while we're engaging in human exploration beyond low Earth orbit, um, and most of the commercializations, you know, close to closer to Earth and low Earth orbit, um, are now going to the Moon. Um, please use our use us as an agent to try to. Um, help help the commercial industry get there. So we're trying to solve our problems and leverage what we know um, to to engage the uh, commercial populate, you know, the commercial industry. Now, as the general population can fly um, into space for four minutes or or four days or two weeks, um, we are going to learn a lot about what happens to uh, the humans that aren't 
government astronauts or aren't professional astronauts. And that's going to be kind of exciting for us, too, is to see how um, the general population responds to spaceflight. I think that's exciting. You know, that's a that's an area we have not studied. We've been studying um, astronauts who have been well screened for health and and fitness. And so we have a kind of a tight semi-homogeneous population. And when you start getting, you know, broadening that um, experience, it's, we will see probably, you know, different responses. So we're excited to see how people respond to those things. That brings up some behavioral science kind of stuff that we've chatted about on this podcast before. I think in addition to the astronauts you've sent before being well screened for health and fitness, they're also pretty well screened professionally for following orders and like doing the exercise they're told to do and all that kind of stuff. Do you worry at all that there's a concern with as we send people into space that won't be as regulated, that'll be having like a lot more just kind of do what they want to do? How do we keep them doing the kinds of things that current astronauts have to do to maintain bone density, muscle mass, all that kind of stuff? Right. Well, you know, astronauts are human too, even though they're well trained and well vetted um, and they have their preferences. So sometimes they, you know, you know, it, they are professional astronauts, so this is a career for them. But, um, you know, they do respond in, in normal human ways. So, you know, if they have a preference, uh, we try to accommodate that, especially when it comes to, you know, the exercises. There's so, only so many accommodations we can make when it's in spaceflight. But um, we try to accommodate, what, you know, if they like to run, you know, we try to give them prescriptions that give them that you know, they give them that, but there, uh, you know, there is a prescription we're trying to get folks to follow that we feel like can um, optimize their health and performance. And some do it and some don't. Um, I will say most, we can, we can find a prescription that, that um, is preferential to them and still gets the job done. But yeah, they're, they're in many ways, like everyone else, even though they're heavily screened. That touched on several of the topics we had on our last conversation with the Acer team. So that leads me to ask how, how frequent, how strong is the collaboration between the research side of the house and the folks who are handling those prescriptions and like giving the training to the astronauts? Well, first, let me say that what we call the research side of the house, the unique part about those laboratories is every single one of them has an operational or clinical role as well as a research role, which is usually unique. And the ACERs are semi-funded by the laboratory. They work very tightly. So you'll see some of the laboratory exercise physiologists working in the gym because they also are CSCS certified. And, and so they can, you know, practice exercise training and, and fitness as well as do research in the lab. And, and, Similarly, some of the ACERs get engaged in some of the research. You know, we almost have to have that synergy between the two. And whether they're working with the exercise phys lab or the neurosciences lab or the nutritional biochemists, um, they do work across uh, many of those disciplines, which is, which is great. It hasn't always been that way, but I think that um, the culture is such that we have to do that in order to advance um, the prescriptions of, you know, and, and advance the way we, uh, develop countermeasures for the health of the astronauts and performance of the astronauts. So I think it's a great synergy between the two. You think, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because again, that's another thing that we talked about when we had the ACERs on. And I think in the military space and really in sort of the collegiate and professional sports space, one of the things you hear a lot about is this I don't want to say a rift, but certainly a, a gap between the research side of exercise science and the, the practical application side. So much so that you could almost label some strength coaches as like, oh, he's like a data guy and, and the other coaches don't even know mm -hmm. how to abstract. And a theme that keeps coming up on the NASA side of the house is that you guys have a really nice synergy, like you mentioned, between the, the lab based stuff and the practical stuff. So I know you, you sort of just touched on this, but I'd be curious from your perspective, what kind of lessons learned have you seen as you created that relationship? Because I know that it's something that this industry being strength and conditioning seems to be lacking. And it's something that I know a lot of coaches want to see improve this, you know, synergy between research and application. So I won't say it's perfect. I won't say it's perfect. 
we have um, before we had ACERS, the exercise lab or the you know were invited into the gym by the astronauts personally to come help them train, and that's when we started realizing and getting ready back in the day for Hubble uh, for the Hubble uh, EVAs mm -hmm. to um, repair the Hubble tel space telescope. Um, we realized that we needed a dedicated group of folks that could go and be there all the time and help help the astronauts. Many of the ACERs, not all, but many have come through the lab, started in the lab, and then transitioned over to be an ACER. So mm -hmm. they have a really um, intense understanding of what's going on, what's coming, um, moving forward as you know, new countermeasures and studies are, are being developed. So that helps the synergy. And then in the past, we've also had like a job swatch, swap, a, jo a job swap <laughs> where you have an acer full-time in the lab and then one of the lab folks full-time in the gym so uh we have worked hard to keep that um synergy tight like i said it's still not perfect but i think it's it's you know it's pretty well improved over the years and there's lots of ways to do that so yeah and and they're and, very respectful of each other and, and work together. You know, we're developing new, when we're developing new exercise countermeasures, we will invite the ACERs to be part of that, um, you know, human in the loop testing and procedure writing and all those things. And also engage our engineers. So it really is a community. Mm -hmm. And flight surgeons, I should, I don't want to leave out the flight docs. So um, it is a community. It isn't just, you know, an individual or two individuals at the end. They're just, you know, at the end of the sphere, there's a group of folks that are really coming together to try to um, manage and optimize crew health and performance. Do you think that that's a product of, I suppose the, it might sound dramatic, but like the life or death aspect of the mission. I mean, you're literally putting humans in space, which is an incredibly foreign environment. Like, do you think that's what drives the common goal across all those disciplines or is it more just a product of like, Hey, this is how effective human performance needs to be done at a high level. Having a common goal is certainly makes things easier. Um, and I know, you know, in athletics, you have that often mm -hmm. in the military, you have that. So it certainly um, drives home why we're here and why we need to, to work together. So I wouldn't want to uh, minimize the importance of having that common goal. And I think that's not just in space. You know, we have big, com big goals that everybody can see. But, mm -hmm. you know, other occupations have common goals as well. And I think um, that can be leveraged to bring a team together. Mm -hmm. So with that team all working on these problems, I guess a two-part question. What are some of the, the biggest challenges you guys have overcome when it comes to human performance mm -hmm. stuff in space? And then as you look towards the future longer duration space flight kind of stuff, what are the biggest challenges you see on the horizon? Oh my gosh. You know, there's many. You know, doing things in space is hard. Space is hard and extremely remote. And the further they get away, the more remote it is. <laughs> literally. It, it is literally. And it is hard. It's, um, and you know, you can't just buy a treadmill and put it on a, you know, on a space station. It, you have to engage um, a lot of creativity in ac across that community. The engineers have the hard job. You know, we know we think we need to keep people healthy and fit. The engineers have to figure out a way to um, get that into whatever vehicle we're flying on. And there are so many restrictions and limitations um, from weight and volume and power and, you know, launch loads and, and um, <clears throat> you can't impart uh, any kind of, um, you know, as you're running on a treadmill, you can't impart those, those foot forces into the vehicle. So you have to isolate you know, one of the biggest challenges in exercise anyway is isolation of a device from the vehicle itself and still get the proper exercise loads. So when you see a cycle ergometer or a treadmill or this resistance, the ARED, the resistance exercise device working on station, all that is isolated from the vehicle, but mm -hmm. still giving the loads the, the crews need. And the engineering challenges associated with that are massive. It's really, it's really quite difficult. 
Um, I would say also just how we restrain a uh, astronaut on the device. So we have to get clever about how you can um, run on a treadmill because if you don't have a harness to hold you down, you will oh, not be running on a treadmill very long. <laughs> so, um, so making those uh, accommodations for running in space or lifting, you know, a resistance in space, I'd say weight, but it's not weight, a resistance in space or riding a cycle, a uh, cycle ergometer in space and being able to load them the way properly or give them the resistance they need properly. You really have to have that, uh, that vibration isolation system and you have to have a proper harnessing to it so that we can um, properly exercise them. And those harnesses sometimes are very uncomfortable. So it's really quite a uh, journey to develop that capability. And it really is a partnership between the physiologists and the acers and the docs and the crew um, have to be engaged and also our engineers. So um, we have not fully perfected those. Uh, there's always room for improvement, but we've done pretty well. We've done pretty well for the, for the crew. Um, on station anyway. So this is this is a real cheesy question that came to mind as you were answering that with like a red and all the systems you have in place. I routinely get advertisements for e stim devices that promise to like activate your muscles and give you abs while you're lying on the couch and all that stuff. Um, obviously, questioning their claims a little bit, but I've also seen them trying to like get that into military acquisition systems and things like that. I, I assume NASA had to like at least look at those things to see if there was any feasibility there. And I don't hear you guys using them a lot. Is that, did that happen? So I'll, I'll tell you just in general, make a general statement about, we get a lot, probably the military, the sports industry, probably we all get um, approached by the latest new widget, right? That mm -hmm. can make you fit. Um, we have a series of requirements for what we need for space flight. And so we compare anything that comes to us against those requirements. And, you know, if it's, I don't know the list off the top of my head, but if there's 10 requirements and you, and you, and you hit three, you know, it may not be uh, meet our needs. So we try to do it objectively. We try to measure our assessments objectively that way so that, and, and we share those, you know, with folks that, that come to us, we'll share those requirements with them and tell them, okay, well, you know, this is what we really need. And then they can go off and, um, and try to make adjustments or not. It just, you know, space is different and, and you, you know, it's different than doing exercise in a gym or in your backyard or in your garage or wherever you do your exercise. Um, and uh, so we have specific requirements that things, that things have to meet. You guys, cause I know we've, we've seen the videos and we've talked about kind of the three, pieces of equipment that get used, the resistance training piece, the the cycle ergometer and the treadmill. And it seems like those three things have stayed relatively fixed for a long time. Is there like what what's what's on the horizon in terms of equipment? Is it is that going to stay kind of the suite of equipment or or will you guys add things or take things away or what what might change for those three pieces? So, we're always looking for ways to improve. It's very expensive to change those out. We have um, the current treadmill is our second treadmill. So we have upgraded our treadmill about half, you know, about 10 years ago, I guess. Um, we have, in fact, we're in the process of replacing our cycle ergometer to a, to a new one. Um, so you'll see a new one in, in the coming months. And um, we will be, we have tested out other technologies as what we'll call a technology demonstration. So we don't go operational until we know these things work. Um, we have looked at others as technology demonstrations on station. And because they haven't it worked, we haven't changed, we haven't added those to our suite. We are getting ready to fly another um, device that is called an E4D that has been um, developed by the Danish Aerospace um, Company. And in fact, the Danish aerospace company has made, they've built our cycle ergometer also. So they have experience building oh, cool. um, light hardware. And, and this is called an E4D and it it's, it's one device, but it has four modalities in it. 
So it has a rower and a cycle ergometer and a resistance exercise device and a rope pull. So that will launch soon and we will do some uh, technology demonstration uh, exercises on it to see how it works. And then we expect to be using it for an upcoming study if we, if we, if it's deemed um, functional for space flight and we'll leave it on station. We'll use it for a study that that's uh, actually the study has already started, but um, it will add a dimension to that study. So huh. yeah, excited to see, you know, some new hardware. I didn't even think about rowing. That's a good point. Yeah. So we have had rowers. We flew two rowers on the space shuttle um, as demonstration for demonstrations. We flew them on the mid deck of the space shuttle. So uh, a question on that, this is all based on like the situation that a space station provides in terms of the amount of space involved, how long people are there, all those kinds of things. And if I'm not mistaken, we're, we're inside of 10 years of end of mission for the space station. And we're starting to look more and more towards longer duration, farther distance kind of space flight stuff. Does that require like a pretty complete rethinking of what equipment can be put on whatever platform you're looking at and where, where is your team at with that stuff? So indeed we do. So we look at all the different, we call them design reference missions. So all the different types of missions that are upcoming. So it could be, so we're in long duration, how we categorize station right now is long duration, low earth orbit, but there may be shorter duration, low earth orbit, like shuttle or shorter station missions. They will be, there are going to be short, shorter, you know, sorties that go to the moon and then eventually on the moon and, and then longer missions on the moon. And then of course, anything going to Mars is long duration. Um, so we look at those and then we try to qualify what the requirements are for each one of those types of missions. So indeed, when we go to the moon, Artemis two on the Orion, we will have an exercise device. We fought hard, long and hard to get one on there. And they gave us about the volume of a little bit bigger than a shoebox. And it also has to double as a step. So, <laughs> so as I said, there are certain requirements that come along with flying things in space. So we will be flying for the first time a flywheel device. And oh. it's it's small. We're testing it out right now. We're doing some human in the loop testing right now in the lab, which we're engaging astronauts, flight surgeons, acers, and of course the lab personnel. And we will fly that on Artemis two with, with this first crew that's going out and back. And we will, I can't wait to get their feedback, but it is similar to a rowing capability. Um, but there'll also be some resistance capability on it as well. But um, we will learn a lot. We've never flown uh, successfully flown a flywheel. So we will learn a lot. This is an unproven device. So we're excited to, to get the ball rolling there. I, I, this, this may come across as a dumb question, but as you were talking about exercise equipment, it came to my mind because previously everything that we've referenced has to function almost gyroscopically as you orbit through space. Does that change when you get into conversations about setting up permanent installations on things like the moon? Now you don't have to deal with navigating orbit and all of that. And it's still, it's fixed, but we still have the issue of not having gravity. So like, how does that, is that part of the conversation or am I just out here on a limb somewhere? No, it's always part of the conversation. You know, we're going to be, that's a different design reference mission, right? If you're actually on a surface, it kind of changes the rules a bit. Mm -hmm. And you may have more volume to work with. You know, in Space Station, we have quite a bit of volume on Orion. It is it is not very large in there. And so that's why we were relegated to this small, small volume that they gave us. And, of course, no power. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. So once we get to a surface, say the surface of the moon, um, and they uh, have missions where they're going to stay a little bit longer than, than a week or two, um, we will, you know, we will install some type of exercise uh, capability there because we do not know what the contribution of one sixth gravity is to maintaining your health and fitness. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have an idea of what one gravity does and what zero gravity does or microgravity does, 
but we do not know what the contribution of one sixth gravity, which is the gravity on the moon, or one third gravity, which is the gravity on Mars, will how that will contribute to maintaining your, you know, your bone and muscle and, and cardiovascular condition. So, so that will be something new for us to learn. Is there a way, I mean, and I can't imagine that you could, but how do you figure that out without just actually putting someone there? Is it just kind of you, you wing it and hope and give your best guess and then you send them up there and hope that that aligns up with what you hypothesized? Well, we try not to wing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Educated guess. Um, we do have various capabilities for us to, te to uh, for us to test some things. So there's various analogs where, um, you know, of course, we can fly in parabolic flight. You know, we can do microgravity. We can also do Martian and lunar gravity. So we can test some of the hardware in those, in those environments. Um, what we can't really test is, and we can test maybe the, um, uh, the biomechanics of operating in those environments and maybe model some things. Uh, with that data, we also use um, other analogs like bed rest. So we use a six degree head down bed rest to model zero gravity. And we do have a lunar gravity model that's similar for bed rest that helps us assess the phys what are the physiological changes that we might be able to expect mm -hmm. um, in a for a lunar mission. The lunar missions are going to be very different. We're going to be doing a lot of EVAs or a lot of spacewalks um, mm -hmm. on the surface. And... Um, and they're just going to be very different. And you have this partial gravity. So there, you know, at some point, you know, we will have to do the assessments on the surface itself, yeah. but we can do a lot of things to learn, um, learn about a lot of physiology and behavioral health before we get there. And in fact, we have, you may have heard the Chapia of the Chapia experiment that's ongoing right now. It's a 373 day Martian mission that's in a habitat on site at the Johnson oh, yeah. Space Center. I heard about so that. we have four people living in a habitat, Martian habitat for over a year. They're uh, this, just this week of oh, 378, Anna says. 378, 378 days. They're, just this week, they hit their 100-day mark. Uh, so we were celebrating that with them. And they have an outside uh, Martian surface where they do uh, EVAs or they do their spacewalks and they use some virtual reality um, while they're doing the tasks and the spacewalks. But it's a, it's a very large experiment and for very brave people, who have um, volunteered to do this. They're quite remarkable. They're very astronaut-like. They scoured, you know, the United States to find candidates for that. And there's um, an engineer, two scientists, and a physician that are the crew. So they, they definitely are astronaut-like uh, as test subjects. And uh, th things seem to be going quite well in there. Well, I remember, so I used to live in Tucson, and the biosphere was right up the road. And you know, it was all, I don't remember when they did that experiment, you know, they basically locked people in there for an extended period of time. And anytime I hear about people doing that, I think back to the biosphere. Oh, you know, like it was great. And then they had some issues with personalities and blah, 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 blah. It's like, man, I cannot imagine being locked somewhere on earth, pretending like you're in space for over a year. That would be, that would be interesting. Yeah. The Chapia habitat is much smaller than the biosphere. And, and we did a very, you know, we did a vigorous um, mm -hmm. assessment of the test subject candidates did a lot of just as we do with, with astronauts, when we're selecting astronauts, you do a lot of the, the, you know, the health assessments, but also the behavioral health assessments. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a stellar team and we're excited to see how things come out, but they've got 270 something days left. Oof, good luck. Um, yeah. I, I want to ask you, and maybe stepping away from exercise equipment specifically, but with everything that you're looking at and have looked at over the years, I mean, space is such an insane concept to think about. Is there anything that you guys have discovered or found out that just makes you kind of take a step back and go like, wow, that is that is crazy relative to how the human body reacts or anything pertaining to exercise science in this field? Like, because I can imagine you guys would discover some things and you're like, the human body is insane. The human body is remarkable. Um, 
it it really is how quickly it can adapt to its environments. I mean, and you see that on Earth, right? You see that on Earth. But, um, you know, space is a very hazardous environment and challenging environment, and the body does adapt rather quickly. Everybody adapts at a different rate and in a different way. Um, there, you know, and as you know, the physiology, we study the physiology pretty closely on, on how that, how that occurs. And what we do know is even with this, with this very healthy crew, with a very healthy crew, they all adapt differently and they all respond to their countermeasures differently. So we have to tailor as much as we can to each crew member. Um, so for sure, they adapt on their way up. You know, once they get to space, takes about on station anyway, it takes about 30 days to kind of level off, you know, and hit their, you know, I like to say it's a hit their zero gravity homeostasis. Mm -hmm. And then they're good for a while. I mean, they still may be deconditioned. Some of the systems still may be deconditioning. Um, and then when they come home, um, they rapidly start adjusting to gravity, even on their, even on the way on the way in, you know, again, different systems respond differently and, and are slower to, and are slower to um, readapt to their earth-based homeostasis, but many things happen and you can watch, we, we, well, we do watch it as crew members are, have returned home over days and weeks and months and years. So some things we'll monitor just, you know, for the first 45 days, which is that um, recovery phase where we protect them and they get two hours of, of training and rehab for 45 days, but we still follow them for, you know, six months, a year on certain things that might respond more slowly, like bone responds more slowly than, mm -hmm. than um, the sensory motor system, which responds rapidly. And so we'll follow them, but we also follow astronauts health even after retirement. So we'll have them come back and do um, follow-up exams, uh, their physical exams, over, you know, years, um, even after they retire, so we can see what the long-term health consequences might be of spaceflight. So, while you guys were talking about that, I was kind of glancing through some of the Chapia stuff because it's fascinating. But mm -hmm. my my question is about how you approached the exercise and human performance portion of the Chapia experiment because it, from what pictures are out there, it looks like there is a rower, a bike, a bench. And then like a couple tough tread modified curve treadmills. How were those things selected for it? And like, what are you trying to simulate there? So the team of scientists, so there's a team of scientists that, that um, came together to decide what that would look like. And they tried to make it look like what we would have when we get to Mars. So you'd have resistance exercise, you'd have a cycle ergometer, um, you would have, you know, similar to what we have on station. And, and then you'd have um, a treadmill and rowing capability. And, and, you know, part of that is for entertainment, it's for health, it's for behavioral health, it's for, you know, blowing off steam, it's, you know, time away. Um, exercise meets a lot of needs. And um, just like in space, if the treadmill breaks, they have to fix it. You know, there's, you know, and, or anything, you know, if the toilet breaks, they have to fix it. All those things we don't send in, you know, the gremlins at night that fix everything up to make it perfect <laughs> while they sleep and then sneak out. We don't do that. Um, but so they may have to do some some repairs and updates and, and those sorts of things, just as a crew would do in space. Um, but they were pretty much selected based on what our anticipation of, you know, being able to recover a crew after a six to nine month mission of microgravity to get there and make sure that they are healthy and fit enough to do um, an EVA in one third gravity. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really an estimation of what we think we'll have to be doing once we get to Mars to keep them healthy. I wanted to originally ask this question rather, rather simply, which was like, if there was an, if there was one singular piece of equipment you could add to the current options, like what would it be? But broadening that more to like an, a, a physiological question, when you think about the long duration type space flight, is there kind of one gnawing question or one gnawing unknown 
thing that you guys are curious about and, and wondering how you might address it with an additional piece of training equipment or with some additional resources that you might be able to allow on a longer duration mission like that, if, if that makes sense? So that's a great question. Oh, thank you. I'll say we're always looking for the next best thing. So we're always doing kind of a tech watch to see what's out there that might um, add to the suite that we have for station and might add, might be just the perfect thing to send to Mars or the moon. Um, so, so with that said, we're always seeking the next thing. Um, what we have on station is a complement. You know, it's a suite of exercises that we think are not redundant, but they complement each other. And the other thing is if one thing goes down, we can we can e quickly shift the prescription to address, um, you know, aerobic capacity or skeletal muscle strength. Um, there are certain things that we can't, you know, that they that they're unique. Each device is a little bit unique for, but we try to make it so this complement can cover most our bases of what we know we see in losses and musculoskeletal, sensory motor, aerobic capacity, all those things. Um, so it's good to have a complement. You know, it's a little scary when we're forced to just have one device mm -hmm. because if that breaks, then we have nothing. And that's never good. So 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 I'll leave it at that. The the thing is, there's things that we don't know. We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. We're always learning. Um, you know, we we uncover things. You know, there's not a large sample size of people that have flown in space and flown in space for long periods of time. And and as our population spends more time, has more exposure, other things start to be revealed. It was just you know, maybe 10 years ago that the, um, the eye issues started to reveal themselves after crew members were in space for two or three months. And we had not seen that before. So we are still studying this um, space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, as we've coined it, SANS. And it is, you know, it doesn't happen to everybody. And everybody ex I should say everybody, but some people express their symptoms differently than others. So it's been very hard to wrap our arms around it. We don't have a an understanding of the mechanism, full mechanism on why it happens to some and not to others. We haven't come up with a full countermeasure for it yet. We're still testing countermeasures. We've finally come up with an analog, uh, an Earth-based analog, where we can study it on Earth um, but we didn't have, you know, all this takes time. And when you're only getting two or three or four people per year, uh, you know, American astronauts a year flying, and only a part of them, only a portion of them actually get the condition, it's hard, to, it's very difficult to, to get an understanding of. So there are things out there that we know we don't know yet, and that will reveal themselves and offer us new challenges. And, you know, once we get to the surface of the moon or the surface to mars who knows that that'll be a whole new world for us too so um we'll always be looking for countermeasures that can address holistically the body as much as possible hmm. and um, to try to keep people healthy but we'll see keeps it interesting <laughs> so i know we're starting to get close to your hard stop here and i want to be respectful of your time mm -hmm. so the as kind of like a, a wrap-up question a huge theme across all of NASA's work has been that discoveries you make in the course of preparing for and executing spaceflight have relevance and applicability for those of us stuck here on on one G Earthlings, or Earth Earth's surface, right? So, what are what are some examples of things you've learned about human health and performance that can enhance the way we approach those topics for people who aren't going to space? Okay. Well, first I can say that we use an awful lot of terrestrial medicine to inform what we're going to do, you know, where that's where we start, what we're going to do in space flight. Um, there are many examples of, of how space flight has um, with now what we call NASA spinoffs and how it's, how it's benefited earth, um, the uh, earth challenges. A couple things with exercise. One thing we know is astronauts do better when they eat well, 
and they exercise. Boy, that's revolutionary, isn't Shocking. it? Shocking. Yeah, out of this world. So, so, you know, what we're told on Earth applies in space in that case. One of my favorite examples of what we have learned that we couldn't have really learned here is, is with bone physiology and, um, and how quickly bone can be lost with unloading in space and um, how some of our countermeasures can try to mitigate that. The other thing is how bone recovers. So when the astronauts, even though, you know, we have been doing better at mitigating the loss of bone um, and astronauts, it used to be one to 2% per month of loss where um, aging, you know, aging females would lose 1% per year. So we've been able to mitigate that some with exercise, with vitamin D, with with the diet, with and in, in, even in some cases we've test uh, we've tested um, bisphosphonates um, to try to mitigate that. So we know that we can slow it down. We cannot necessarily eliminate it. So some people lose more bone than others. Like I said, there's a lot of in, individual variability. So. Some may lose, even with all the countermeasures that we throw at them, some will still lose more than others. The cool thing is, is when they come back, what we've been able to watch is how they recover once they do come back to Earth and they are um, exposed to one gravity and they, and they go through their rehabilitation and recovery phase. The bone itself, there's cortic cortical bone and there's trabecular bone. And the cortical, both, we lose both types of bone in space. But when they recover on earth, the cortical bone gets thicker. But though the webbing, I call the, the infrastructure, the architecture of the trabecular bone, once those strands are broken, they do not recover. Hmm. So the two types of bone recover differently. And we're not quite yet sure on what that does to fracture risk. But while your bone density may come back, the actual architecture changes. So it's really kind of cool to watch. It's cool that we've been able to recover bone. You know, it was really great to know that when crew members who came back could recover their bone density, but the whole architecture is a little bit different now. Jeez. So kind of interesting. I will offer a quick shout out, especially to keep NASA public affairs happy. If you're if interested in all that kind of stuff that Judy's talking about with NASA spinoffs, they have a whole page dedicated to it. And there's some super interesting stuff on there. Everything from like keeping your bed at a, a specific temperature to sleep better to like thermal layers to there's one recent one on here for like reducing wrinkles on your face. There's there's just about everything if you'd want to dig into the the spinoff stuff. Thank you, you NASA. Need. I think they have over 2,000 spinoffs that they've published so far. So, yep. And Anna just put Anna's it. Anna's on it. <laughs> yep. She put it in the chat. I'm pretty so. sure I had already shared the spinoff page, so I didn't give it to you again. No, yeah, I think <laughs> you did. This is a different one. We've brought up the spinoffs a couple of times. So, thank you. Um, well, Judy, I know that we've, we've squeezed our way into your schedule, and I know you have a lot more going on today. So, I want to be the first to say thank you for your time. This has been, I think, the perfect capstone to the last couple of episodes we've done with the whole human performance team and just NASA's kind of physio physiology program in general. So, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, it is a community. There's, I'm just one person. There's a huge community and including the, we like to include the astronauts as well to make sure that it's, you know, we're doing things that, that they want to embrace. Otherwise it wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks so anyway, much. Thanks so much for having me and good to see you guys. Yeah. Hey Alex, let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter in, mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes, our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. 
Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and we receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in-depth in kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website. Thank you.